Guys, my name is Mike McNamara. I'm co-founder and the head of programming for the fest. Thanks to everyone for braving the snow. I think we're the only thing that didn't get canceled tonight, so a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> The snow's really not that bad out there. I mean, the streets are fine. We we had we had our festival launch two years ago in Snowmageddon, which was <laughs> legit. Okay, that was legit. We probably should have canceled. This is nothing. This is what we call flurries. It's flurries. So as you guys know, uh, we do our best to pack the house every first Tuesday, so you got to get here right at six o'clock to get a good seat. So we always want to have some great engaging. Uh, activities and discussions going on here in the theater prior to our film program. Some months it'll be a camera demo for Canon, uh, maybe a screenplay reading. Most months it's our producers panel, so we get some industry stalwarts, some industry luminaries together to talk about some different areas of the film and television production industry, their struggles and successes, and, and kind of uh, their careers and what's inspiring them creatively these days. So today, uh, we like this guy so much, we said it's just gonna be you today. It's just gonna be you. So uh, the moderator is the wonderful Nina Metz, who uh, is always helping us out. Let's hear it for Nina. And uh, this gentleman, uh, he's in town right now, uh, working on the hit series, uh, Chicago Fire. Uh, he co-created it with his writing partner, Michael Brandt, whom a lot of you guys met at the BMAs, our gala in December. And he's the co-writer and executive producer. Can we please get a loud round of applause for Mr. Derek Hess. Yeah. I grew up in Texas, but uh, I live in Los Angeles now, so I was not ready for this. I had to borrow from costumes at Coach. You created a show called Chicago Fire, so we had a new in the future. Yeah, we, we were here this time last year um, shooting the pilot. And it was 80 degrees, so I was, I was not prepared. So walk us through, uh, prior to this, you've been a novelist and a uh, screenwriter for films. Talk to us about how you go into TV now. So we, we'd always, Brent and I had written a few movies that were successful, so we always um, had the call from the TV agents saying, would you guys want to do television? And we'd always said no, because we like working out of our houses, and. Um, we like our lives, and then uh, and then they called this last year, last summer a year ago, and said um, Dick Wolf uh, has a show. He wants to do a show about firemen um, for NBC. Are you guys interested? And it hit us right at the right time. We had we had done a little independent movie that Brian had directed called The Double that um, didn't do very well, and it was, took a lot out of us. And so we were like. Yeah, let's let's give it a shot. So that was the uh, impetus to going into television. We were lucky because they had already sold the show to NBC. Um, just Dick Wolf and Firefighters. That was it. And so then they called us and, and made a deal before we even pitched the series. So. So some of that heavy lifting had already been done. Is the angst of pitching it? And yeah, we didn't have to pitch, which was very nice. And um, and then we went into Dick's up. We actually already had our deal before we met Dick. And then we went into Dick's office and said, we should set the show in Chicago. And uh, we said, this rescue made them in New York, and so it's tied to 9-11. Um, it would be hard to do a firefighter show there. And you know, the only other place to really do it, a, a city that was born out of fire, was Chicago. So we said, that was on Wednesday, and we, I said, literally, I know nothing about Chicago, and I know nothing about firefighters, so put us on a plane. And we came here um, that Friday. We stayed a week and a half um, doing write-alongs with the fire department. Went home for a week, came back for another week and a half doing write-alongs with the fire department. Um, what was that like? Uh, incredible. They're, they're, you, you realize these guys are the guys that run into buildings that rats and roaches run out of, and, and and they're hilarious. And you'll, you'll sit with firemen, sit at the table, and in five minutes you'll be laughing so hard you fall out of your chair, and then they'll tell another story and you'll have tears in your eyes. And we just knew, okay, that, that's a television show, let's make it an ensemble. We went back and we pitched NBC Now, um, here's what the show would be, 10 characters, all in a firehouse, um, a family, uh, both in and out, and follow them home, and we'll be, 
Well, them all along is we want to do ER in a firehouse, and that's, that's what we should do. Yeah. I remember there was a moment in the pilot that stuck with me. I just thought it was great. Uh, they're in a fire truck going to the fire, and I think it's Dave Eidenberg's character is reading the newspaper. Yeah, we were in one of the first uh, calls we went out on. Um, there was a guy uh, who's in the squad, and he was reading an astrophysics book. And we were like, God, if we put that in, nobody would believe that, you know, the <laughs> show. And, uh, and so that gave us the idea. And then that first call that we went on was a girl that jumped in from a, a train. And, um, and they pulled her out from the, underneath the third car, and she was missing half her head. And you, and, you know, it was kind of like when my wife gave birth, I didn't think I could sit in there and watch the whole thing, but they did. And, uh, and that became, there was an episode we did with um, Blue Mills, you know, had our time. So Chicago, what what specifically did you think you needed to do when you arrived in the show to capture the Chicago itself? Well, the one thing was we wanted to use we you know ER shot in Los Angeles other than a week and when the firemen roll out, one of the things that's so great about opportunity for drama was to get these short descriptions of what they're rolling out to. So it'll say accident in the transition, or it'll say man down from unknown causes. That could be a, a you know, a wino in the street, or that could be somebody who fell off the wheelchair. And what we wanted was when you roll out of that firehouse, if you go right, you could be in the projects. If you go left, you could be downtown or uptown. And uh, and so all of that's got to be Chicago. So we write into the scripts, you know, specific locations that we want to shoot. And um, so, you know, everybody always says make the town a character, you know. That, this one really is, you know. It, 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 the weather is, is incredible. You yeah. were saying that you were shooting today? Yeah, we shot today. I was freezing my ass off um, out in front of the fire. And shoveling snow? I shoveled snow today. Um, only for a photo opportunity. I was kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> you go to Vietnam and you act like, well, whatever. I, was, I had to pretend I was. No, it was fun. It was really fun. We did a great scene today in the blizzard and the um, blizzard. What I consider a blizzard. Uh, and uh, yeah, we do not write, we do not change the day for weather at any time. If it rains, it rains. If it doesn't, that's what the firemen do. You know, that's very much in line, I think, with Dick Wolf's other shows. I mean, I can remember <coughs> countless long order episodes where they're outside and it's snowing or whatever the weather is. And so I think it'd be interesting for you to talk a little bit about. Uh, you know, the show came to audiences with this uh, sort of branding of Dick Wolf. Yeah. What does that mean for you as a writer trying to establish your own identity? And um, that, is there a type of show that you have to create when you're creating a show? I can say the great thing about Dick Wolf, and, and from the get go, we hit it off with him, is he was a writer. And uh, it still is. And we, you know, from, from the beginning, he accepted that we're not doing a procedural, that he's done for 26 consecutive seasons a procedural. We said this is gonna be, you know, we're gonna follow him home, we're gonna get to know these characters, it's gonna be, like I said, thematically about a, a family who fights and works and plays and loves together. And he embraced it from the get-go. And, uh, and you know, what he does, he has a sign on his desk that says, it's the writing stupid. And, uh, and when we first went, um, when we were going to shoot the pilot this time last year, we went to dinner with our cast the night before, and a giant table, you know, we have, like I said, 10 characters, and uh, he stands up beforehand and he said, um, he said, I've had a show on the air for 26 consecutive years, and the reason is the writing, so when you come to the set, you're going to know your lines, and you're going to do the lines as written, and you'll you'll always have an opportunity, we'll get the scripts to you ahead of time so you can talk with the writers about it. But once we go to final script, that's the script you're gonna perform. And we've, we've had actors come up to us and say, uh, it says they are going to go, can I say they're gonna go? We're like, yeah, you can also be the AP. Contraction, you can use it. <laughs> um, what is his involvement? Uh, he reads every outline, he reads every script, he comments on the cuts, but at the same time he's let us, you know, he's let us make the show. And uh, he came out here for the pilot and for the um, reshoot of the first scene, and, and he hasn't been back 
but he's coming back for you know towards the end. But he's involved as much as he wants to be. Really, but he makes comments. It's funny because his um, we thought because we worked in movies that you're gonna get these notes that'll be like you know we don't like the last third and um, the main character should have a dog to be more likable and those kind of things. But instead he'll be like we got a big problem. We got a big problem. Like, oh what is it? Casey cannot walk into the scene first. Oh, so the reverse the order. Okay, all right. That's the that's the love. But he's awesome. He's the best. He's really, really true to us well. And the network notes come from him, or they come? From no, him? no, no. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> you get network notes, um, which they've been great. I gotta say, we've been really lucky, and maybe it's because we have Dick Wolf and he's you know he's on the gorilla. Um, but they've, uh, they've just, NBC, I gotta say, from the start has loved the show, and so they've treated us really well. We have a showrunner that we hired, because Michael and I had done television before in Matt Olmstead, and Matt uh, was our friend. We've been friends with Matt for 12 years. He, he ran in like a blue for the last five years. He did Prison Break, which shot here for the first season, and he did Breakup Kings, and uh, it just lucked out that his Breakup Kings was ending. And so we introduced him to Dick, and he dicked it off. So the three of us have been doing the show from the start. Quickly explain to everyone what a showrunner does. Well, he's the boss of the production, pretty much. I mean, he's in charge creatively. Um, you guys sure. are in charge. Well, the three of us is the way it's been. But, but like the things I, that he that we've learned, which is awesome, is that it's his problem. Like, <laughs> like if the network says, you know, we don't, we don't want this dog in this episode. We're like, all right, we have to work that out. With them. Like, we don't have to do it. <laughs> so the show actually does have some Chicago bona fides in it. An executive producer of the show, Joe Chappelle. Yeah, he's great. Is uh, has lived in Evanston for a long time. I uh, believe he went to Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, his family lives there. His kids live there. In fact, they've lived there throughout his entire career when he's worked on other shows. I know he's been. Uh, producer and director on CSI Miami and The Wire, and you and I were talking about the fact that he, he actually commuted when he worked on the show, so he would be in Miami for the week and then come home to Evanston on the weekend, every weekend. Yeah, he's what we call a producing director, which means that he is our, our go-to uh, director that stays on for all 24 episodes, and any new director that comes in, he meets with, talks to them about how we do the show, how we do the cast. He's also directed five episodes for us, so... He's, he's awesome. So it's nice probably to have a Chicago it's guy. Yeah. That's right. Certainly some of the cast members. Uh, David Eigenberg grew up in a suburb of Chicago. Yeah. Um, brings that. And certainly Christian Stoltz. Awesome. Chicago guy. He yeah, he's great. Mouch. Yeah, he does Mouch. Talked about Mouch. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we were sitting in a firehouse and um, there was like a guy who was in his 60s and he was the last guy on the truck. And uh, and they're like, oh, he's a short timer, you know, he's he's almost done. And they're like, we call him Malch, half man, half couch, and we're just laughing so hard. About that. Yeah, we're like, okay, we gotta have a Malch. But I mean, that's like that's around firehouses. They call a lot of guys Malch. So we just love that. And then then we hired Christian, um, who we it's one of our friends that worked with him on a short film, I think, and uh, and he got the part. And then you know. Like I said, we had to It was a small part. Yeah, small in the pilot, but you, we knew we were going to develop these guys. But they are also great. It's fun to write for them because we, they all do different things, and as you get to know the characters better, you think, okay, we'll put him with her. Like, we, we make him the union rep, which is um, something that the fire department has. And so when, when Dawson, played by Monica Raymond, gets in trouble, we thought, oh, this would be hilarious, get, get Malch with Monica. And then he turned out to be like Clarence Arrow, you know, he, he saw some case for her, so it was fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Christian is, he's a longtime Chicago theater actor. So it's nice to see local actors get cast on shows like these. Yeah. A lot of times what happens is when films come to town or TV shows come to town, um, you know, it's primarily cast out of Los Angeles or New York, and so you sort of, there's this great pool of acting talent in the theater community, so it's so nice to see someone like Christian um, Get a really nice role. Yeah, show like yeah. That. it's great. No, he's he's fantastic. Yuri, his family lives in Chicago. He plays Otis, um, and uh, so he he went to high school here. Then he went to University of Michigan, where we met him making that movie, The Double. Um, and certainly your guest players. Yeah, all, are almost from all of the guests. Almost all of the guest players are from here, including Mike McNamara. 
Indeed, Midwestern Independent Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> so you created this with your writing partner, Michael Brandt. How does how does that work? I mean, I'm always sort of fascinated by this concept of writing partnerships in Hollywood. Um, if you can get a partner I, that that you trust and are great friends with and share the same voice, I can't recommend it higher because you um, you. We rewrite each other mercilessly. We just send emails back and forth with the script, and it's whoever best idea wins. And and but we we both done been doing it together so long that we just have no ego about it. And it I mean, we never argue. And the and the fact that you have someone to share the experience with in Hollywood because Hollywood can be really tough. And you go into these rooms and and you know ten people against you sometimes. And the fact that you're sitting next to someone who can get cut back out of it, or you know, like I can go home and tell my wife, this is what happened today. But to walk out of the meeting with brands who just experienced it, and it's either like, well, that sucked, or it's like, wow, right? But you know, it's it's awesome to just go through all of it with someone. Plus, I feel like I'm writing just to impress Brand most of the time. You know, so, you know it's awesome. when you write, do you actually sit down together and talk it out and write together, or do you? No, we. We get together to break the story, um, and we'll oftentimes, uh, with our manager, uh, for film, not so much for television, but with, with movies, we get together with our manager and we'll break the story, okay, here's what, here's what it could be. Then one of us will go and write the outline, and then we'll pass that back and forth. And then when we when we go to write the script, we just pass it back and forth. We don't, we don't sit in the same room. Otherwise, we'd be, I'd be like, uh, uh, this is what happens. We have to do it sometimes on movies because because you're you're there and you have to rewrite something on the day and he'll be like, um, you missed a comment. I'll be like, can I finish my fucking thought, please? <laughs> so we're better emailing back and forth. I was surprised to learn I talked to a couple former Second City uh, veterans who are a writing team who now write for Cougar Town. Oh, okay. Um, and I was surprised to learn that when you're first starting out and you're hired as a team, it's one salary. Oh, so yeah. They were hired as a team yeah. for one rate, which yeah. I split. Um, and I wonder, is that true? Yeah, that no, you're, you're a team. that's the one thing. If, you, if you're a movie writer as a team, you will always be that team. Like, it's really hard, especially if you have success, it's really hard to break that team because then the talent is like, wait, did he do it or did he do right. it? And, and so you can't go into it lightly. you know. And the truth is, yeah, you split everything. It's 50%, 50-50. Um, however, you can also do more if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, um, sorry, we're aggressive. Yeah. You can do if you're good. Yeah, if you're good, you can do more than one thing. But that's what so we've always had. Because if I'm working on something, he's not working. So we've always had multiple things going on. Right. Well, quickly about the production of the show. Yeah. Whenever I watch it, I'm curious how much is done on a soundstage and how much is a practical location. So the scenes, let's say, in the garage of the firehouse, is that it looks like you're at the firehouse yeah. on where? Yeah, on uh, in Blue Island. Blue Island. Yeah, that's so the outdoor stuff is all obviously uh, outside that. And also, yeah, outside that, that and house. on the apparatus floor where they have the trucks. Okay. That's that's so always at the. How, did, how does that work out logistically with their schedules? It's fine. Uh, they've been no, they've been awesome. We go one, so we we write it so that there's only less. It's got to be less than eight pages on the apparatus floor, and they. Um, they, so one day per episode, we shoot there. We built them a tent behind the thing for them to have their apparatus on the day that we shoot. So they are still answering calls while we're shooting. I mean, so the, do you have to stop the camera? No, it's not as bad call. as you. It goes off a lot because it's a busy house, but it's not as bad as you think. Okay. Like it, it does happen. It will interrupt takes, but. Um, but then we're, we're so used to it now. You're just right back. You're just literally waiting for the voice to stop and right back, right back on it. Um, but we shot the original pilot there, and then we built that firehouse, the interiors, the exact dimensions inside the You're stage. You're kidding. No. You recreated so that firehouse. We recreated that firehouse on the stage because it looked so cool, you know, and it was, it was uh, yeah, so you can shoot it worse, too. So, we, so it doesn't have a roof, too, so you can shoot down, you know, and we can move walls and all that kind of stuff. But that firehouse is built there. And then we do most of the, almost all of the show is shot on location. But if we have a big fire or something, we'll build that on stage just so we can control, you know, control the fire. So uh, 
Summerides Loft, is a loft here somewhere in town, or is that a Yeah, that's state? a loft. No, that's a loft. Uh, every other location, <laughs> other than Herman's living room, which we used one time on that skating episode. So, uh, so everything, Cinespace uh, is where they shoot yeah. out of. So the soundstage is primarily the inside of the firehouse. That's, yeah, we took up two soundstages. That's great. Yeah. And I mean, you should quickly maybe talk about why that firehouse was the one you guys chose. I mean, I mentioned this in my review of it. There's in the opening scene, the garage doors go up. And what do you see? The Sears Tower. It's like yeah. the iconic Chicago view. Is that why you chose Well, that? it didn't hurt. Um, <laughs> and it's hilarious because like, we'll get shit for, uh, you know, they'll be like, uh, they keep digitally putting in the Sears Tower. I'm like, have you been to Chicago? <laughs> well, this tower is. But we actually, we, I wrote, I wrote into um, uh, episode uh, 13, uh, the opening scene took place at the top of Will's Tower. You know, I visited there with my kids last summer, and uh, I was like, I doubt we'll get that. You know, you write it thinking, God, I don't know if they'll get it, but then they let us shoot there. Yeah. Have there been any locations that you've been turned down? Uh, Girl in the Goat, they turned us down. <laughs> she turned you down? <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> it's so good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe season two. Right. So, I mean, NBC has been having a tough time the past season or two. However, the show has not. The show uh, sort of started off with uneven ratings yeah. that have really stabilized and continue to go up. So, what's your sense of what happens for a possible second season? I, 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 I'm, a, I'm optimistic. I feel like we're going to get it. But I'm not going to say anything until they, they say it. But uh, I'd be shocked if we didn't get it. I mean, we're doing really well now. We beat CSI, an original CSI and original Nashville last week. So, um, no, we're doing, we're doing really well, but I might be shocked. How often do you find that you're in town? Uh, I was here a ton in the fall. Um, we come out here primarily, Brant and I will come if it's an absolute road. And then if it's a writer that is the first time coming, we'll come to, um, to help them with the actors. And then, uh, and then in the spring, uh, I was here the first week of January, and I haven't been back until this week, because um, uh, Brian directed an episode, so he came out for three weeks. I didn't mean to be here then. It was also one degree, so I didn't mind. And then, <laughs> and then I'll be back a bunch for the last, for the last three episodes. How much do you sort of shape the characters to sort of the actors' strengths? And I'm thinking of someone like Taylor Kinney, who does, I think actually does a lot. Like he, he, he does a lot. By doing very little. Yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely find over the course of time, actors, you know, go to strengths and weaknesses. Uh, a good example is Yuri, who plays Otis. You know, the original character, as, as thought of, was kind of a doofus. And then Yuri's really smart. And so it was like, okay, what can we do with that? You know, oh, he came from a family of doctors. That came from just being around Yuri. And, uh, but yeah, well, and Eigenberg plays such a great everyman. That we made him sort of the heart, you know, heart of the show. He's the family guy. You got four kids and all of that stuff. So yeah, you certainly look at your actors and scenes that they do well. But the other thing you try to do as a writer um, is uh, put characters together that you wouldn't think would be together. So we have this runner going where um, Eigenberg, who's sort of a get rich quick guy, which my brother calls me and is like, "Is that me?" Um, <laughs> we had him uh, uh, interested in buying us bar. And then the natural thing to do would have been put him with Otis and with Melch, or put him with Otis and with Cruz. But instead, we put him with Otis and Dawson, which we thought would be fun to get those characters. The woman. Yeah. And plus, she's always sort of a, by the book, you know, or she's a little bit of a hothead, but she's, she's saving her money and all that stuff. So we thought that would be fun. If you do get a second season, are there certain kind of storylines you want to explore? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've already thought about, yeah, we're already talking about it. Definitely. I can't split them. <laughs> so NBC ordered an extra two episodes to round the season up to 24 episodes. Yeah. So you'll be in town through when? So we stopped shooting, I believe, on this, as of today, we stopped shooting on May 3rd. And then if we come back for the second season, July 9th would be the prep, start the prep. That's great. We hope yeah. you come back. Yeah. Yeah. Please. <laughs> I hope so. So, uh, <laughs> Your, your first gigs in Hollywood were obviously through film yep. as a writer. Um, talk about the first movie you and Brant uh, successfully. Yeah, we got lucky. On. We had written some scripts that had sold and gotten us agents, and, um, but we, they didn't get made. And then we were writing for, for Universal. We had written an FBI movie that, um, that uh, September 11th 
um, happened and sort of uh, as a side but that summer um, the Fast and the Furious had come out and they asked us because they liked our FBI script they asked us do we want to write the sequel and we said no and then and, and we just thought we were smarter <laughs> you like were above we're, yeah we're above that we were and then our agent was like the answer is actually yes <laughs> and <laughs> here's why that movie has a start date and you guys haven't had a movie made and and that movie's going to come out um, and and it, it means a lot for your careers to have a movie made and we got very lucky because we wrote um, so we wrote the sequel to the Fast and the Furious and originally it was for Vin Diesel and Rob Cohen, the director, to come back, but Vin, for whatever reason, didn't want to do it. And, and so Rob got off and they hired John Singleton. And we just hit it off with John from the, from the, the first day. So we got And to, John Singleton sort of had some indie cred yeah. early in his career. Well, and he's awesome. He's just, a, he's just a cool guy. And so as writers on a big action movie, a lot of times you get fired. It just happens. They'll bring in three or four writers. There's no rhyme or reason to it. You can't beat yourself up about it. But John liked us. So we got to watch, you know, and I was, I was 30 at the time. We got to watch a, um, a uh, $90 million get made from, from writing the script to prep to shooting in Miami to post. And so it was really like, because I was an English, I got a master's in English lit. I was, a, I was an English guy. And so that was my film school, was getting to. Mm -hmm watch a movie get made. And then it, you know, you can say what you want about the movie, but it was successful enough that, um, that. Uh, was the title already in place? No, we it? called it The Best and the Furious 2 for, until three weeks before. It wasn't your idea to no, say Too say Fast, Too, too fast, Furious. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> I got ludicrous to do a song. So you can Too Fast, Too Furious. Um, and, uh, you know, it, as Michael and I say, it achieved its goals. And then what we what we found, which was true, and why our agent's advice was incredible, was that when you are the writers of a movie that that a a sequel that got made, and then a sequel that got made, and made over a hundred million dollars, um, then all of a sudden you become in a small, really small pool of people that that studios want. And one of the things we did, after, we did a, a kids movie that nobody saw called Catch That Kid right after that. Actually, we were making it during the post on Too Fast. But then Grant and I, who still considered ourselves fancy pants, uh, told our agent we want to meet filmmakers. Like, we, we want to do what we had originally set out to do. And so they put us in a room with um, Jim Mangold, who had done um, some movies we really liked, Copland and, and a movie called Identi uh, ID. And, uh, and he was in prepping walk the line, but we found out his favorite movie growing up was 310 to Yuma. So we said we should modernize 310 to Yuma. We could do, we could do, we could set it in the old west, but, but thematically, the kid who's barely in the original movie, we could make it about sort of a morality film about this kid's soul and he's stuck between, uh, you know, a, a gunslinger and, and his dad who's just trying to put food on the table. And we, we said, those Nike commercials where Charlie, Char, Char, Charles Barkley said, I'm not a role model. That's, that's what we're going to do. Like, and so we pitched that to Columbia, and, um, and Jim was on board, and so we got 310 to Yuma made. And so then, after Too Fast, it was successful. Well, let me interrupt for a moment. Yeah. Is there psychologically, so you didn't really want to make a sequel, sequel but yeah. you did. Is there anything about making a remake that uh, also had a stigma or no? No, no. I, oh, I read the original Elmer Leonard short story first, and then I, I grew up in Texas, so I knew the movie, but then went back and watched the movie again. But I had no fun. I mean, that movie was 50 years old, so. And that movie plays like, the original movie plays like a two play. So I, I kind of knew, and Brant, Brant really broke the middle of that movie. Um, we kind of knew what that story would be. But that opened so many more doors for us because now it was like we could do the, you know, the big. The big actioner and, and the respectful. Yeah, and the respectful movie. So it's, it's something to be said about career management and, and not being put in a box. And you, you, can, you really can do it. So I read that right now you're working on another script, an adaptation of a book. Yeah. Billionaires. Yeah, yeah. Talk one, about that a little bit. That's a great book. Um, Brant, that's Brant's the Brant's more advanced advanced to me. 
he's the big wine drinker. And uh, this is based on a true story. Yeah, based on a true story. So uh, in real life, a a sold at auction for m the most money ever was a bottle of wine that was found in a cellar in Paris after they were doing some remodeling, and it turned out it was Thomas Jefferson's original stash of, of wine, and they were all engraved with a TJ on it. And it, the bottle sold at Christie's auction house for more money than any money ever. And they sold like five of these bottles of wine. And then, and then somebody asked the guy, the, this, this main guy who's a character, Harvey Rudin stuff, uh, how many bottles did you discover? And he's like, well, like, the De Beers mines won't tell you how many diamonds they have. I'm not going to tell you how many bottles I had. And so slowly, it started to unravel that maybe the entire thing was a fraud. And so there's a book written called Billionaire's Vinegar, and then Michael and I, uh, David Kep was going to write it at Sony, but he dropped out, and so Brent and I jumped on it and uh, and wrote it, and so we'll see we'll see if it gets made. But it's it's funny because it's the kind of movie that we took a pay cut to write just because it, it is an awesome story, but it's also the kind of movie that a studio is not dying to make. Like we'll literally have to get some great those two guys are going to have to be great cast. And it's told from the perspective of whom? There's two. It's that it's Hardy Rodenstock who um, who uh, the con man might have forged the bottles, and it's the insurance investigator who was investigating for one of the guys who actually broke one of the bottles, and then the insurance claim that he had. The insurance investigator is the one who started to unravel the story. Do you think at this point in your career, uh, with some successful films under your belt and now a successful television show, does that help boost? The ability to get a film like this? Um, okay. No, I mean, it, it, it certainly helps you getting read by actors that can help you get the movie made, but they're not they're not champing at the bit to have <coughs> just pretty much the script based on that story. Sure, I understand. Okay, so the other side to your writing career is as a novelist. When did you start writing novels? Um, I My first book came out in 2000. Eight or nine, I can't remember. Uh, I've had four books published. And the funny thing is I, I just wrote it, um, the first one without telling anyone I was doing it, because I didn't want Brian to think I was too tiny. And, uh, are they sort of action thrillers? Uh, the first three are about a hitman, um, contract killer. And they're, the first three are all told from his perspective. And they're, you know, they certainly have action elements, but they're, but it's more like what's inside Psychological, yeah, thriller. yeah, and then the and then the fourth one I just wrote um, that just came out in November, and um, it's about a spy. So that's more of a that's more of a. Uh, How do you find the time to do all this writing? <laughs> I just don't stop. I like I love writing, and um, I'm not one of those tortured like oh I gotta vomit over the keyboard because I just have to get it out. I just enjoy it, and it's fun for me, and. Uh, so I just make the time. Do you see yourself sort of uh, interested in pursuing and creating other television shows in the future? Um, <laughs> uh, ask me again in a few years. <laughs> we'll see how, we'll see how gotcha. Okay, so why don't we open it up to some questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it's a very comprehensive interview. It's marvelous. And uh, I'm not trying to be flattered. I love it. Keep it. Keep flattered. <laughs> She's asking uh, if, as a writer, screenwriter, uh, when he takes a pay cut, is he part of a union or is this just freelance? How does that work, the pay scale? Yeah, we have, we're have we part of the Writers Guild, um, which every member is, and they have minimums that you can be paid. Um, but then, as a as a screenwriter, you can charge whatever you can get for your, for your script. So if they want you more, if you have someone big attached, you can make some good money, and they, um, so you start with the minimums, and then you go from there. Oh, you're not on our block. You're not charged by the state, right? I do not charge. She does not. <laughs> Any other questions? Right there? Um, you said that filming will end around May 4th, and if they pick it up, they'll start again in July? Yeah. So, that, so have you already started writing the second season? I mean, no. He asked You're, if they've been writing the second season yet. Sorry. Yeah, no, we've only broke through our 24 episodes. And then, because um, we're shooting number 19 right now. Um, and so, 
The last air date, I think, is May 14th. But those last couple of weeks before we break, because we need a vacation too, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sit with the writers and try to come up with at least, okay, what are the major storylines we're going to have? I mean, we're thinking about it, but we, we certainly haven't written anything that far. Well, that's a good point, though, because you initially thought uh, you'd have 22 episodes. Yeah. NBC ordered an additional two. Yeah. So when you thought there were 22, maybe in your mind you had sort of your season finale in mind. Now you have to do two more. Did that change? No, what happened or? was um, we we had 22 guaranteed. We broke the last four, but pitched NBC 23, like we wanted it to be 23. And they came back a week later and said, what if it's 24? <laughs> so, we, so then we just moved everything four episodes down and put in a new one there. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Right there. Do you think it's possible to be um, a writer in uh, television and film and remain in Chicago, or must you move to Hollywood? She wants to know if you can be a writer for television and film and live in Chicago. Yeah, it's a, or move to Los Angeles. That's a, it's a tough question because it's, a, you know, in, in all honesty, living there, you just have to be that much better because living there is so advantageous only in that um, so many people are in the business. And so you, you know, as, as you, uh, writers who haven't sold anything, you're gonna be around people um, just, just in everyday life that can um, help you. And I feel like that's, that's the main um, way to sell your first script is, you know, you give it to someone who might rig lights on, you know, mini project. And that person might know a producer who reads it and likes it and gives it to someone else. And that's, it's kind of just such a word of mouth town. And, and just <laughs> bumping your, into people. Yeah. And, and sustaining a career too is, I mean, you're just constantly, I mean, Michael and I have meetings all the time just because we live there you know we'll set up a meeting now i got a really good friend who's a big writer who lives in virginia and he just plans on flying in once a quarter and all his agent will set it up so there's 10 meetings every you know every time he comes to town to come for a week so you can certainly do it um, but he broke in in la so I, I i lived in atlanta when i broke in but it was because grant was was in la you know it was, it was it's like, rare but it does happen i can yeah. give you an example keep up is a Chicago playwright. He lives here in Chicago. Tracy he is Lance. a well. Keith is a um, producer and writer on House of Cards, which is the new Netflix show. Uh, and Keith had moved to Los Angeles. He wrote for Mad Men, and then decided, nope, we want to live in Chicago and move back. Um, and he has a number of shows in development. I think he's writing some uh, films too. And he, he does it living here in Chicago. But I do think it's the rare. Okay, so no, you can, you can definitely do it, and, and I'm, I fully believe that you write a great script and it'll glow in the dark and people will find it and want to be a part of it. I really believe that. Um, but I'm just saying it's harder. So. Right. He, I mean, in, in Keith's situation, he was already established. He had a Broadway hit called Steady Rain that uh, Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman starred in, so oh, that, that helps you a lot. Um, <laughs> like mentioned Tracy Letts, who is a actor and playwright here in Chicago at Steppenwolf. He had a huge hit with a play he wrote called August to Osage County, which has been adapted into a film that will come out next fall. Um, he's able to live and work in Chicago just because he's a, a desired commodity. He's already established himself. But again, I think it's these are sort of the rare examples. It doesn't happen as much. And it's a shame. I think it would be great if it was a little more. Just get to know stuff. Daniel Craig. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? Uh, right there. Um, in the course of this season, what have you learned about writing for these episodic, dramatic TV things that you didn't know before, and sort of like even from the beginning of the season till right now about good writing and what makes good writing on these types of shows? Mm -hmm. He's asking specifically about writing for episodic television and what makes that good as opposed to perhaps writing for film. Yeah. Um, Great question. The the uh, thing about TV writing that I've learned is it's like writing chapters in a book as opposed to a, a, a movie has to have obviously a beginning, a middle, and an end. And with with TV, you can you can leave five questions you know that you want the audience coming back for. And what we found, I, I have no idea about other shows because I've never worked on them, but on our show. Uh, we just want thematically that episode to have 
you know, a voice uh, or a theme, um, and they can go out on a fire call and they can, they can, it can seem like these four things aren't going to be tied together, but if you do it right, they all, they all mean something, you know. Like we had heard about uh, a hoarder collapse, which was, a, you know, a basically somebody had been hoarding shit in an apartment and it collapsed on the apartment below and they saved someone. And so that was a cool, like, okay, that sounds like a cool thing. Well, you can't, we can't just have our firemen go there, do that, and come back and it not mean anything. So later we have Herman saying to another character, you know, some people hoard junk, broken junk. I, I hoard broken business opportunities. It's like if you can just tie in those things, that's what we've learned is like Dick Wolf will call it the Chinese menu. Like you can't have five different things in a show that have nothing to do with each other. You got to, you want something dramatic, you, you know, to, uh, to tie, and then and then as far as um, like judging other people's scripts, which that's new for us too, is having writer a writer's room, and um, that's the other thing that we didn't know is like shit. We'll be like a typical day is we're reading an outline, we're writing our own episode, we're reading somebody else's episode, we're going into the editing room and seeing the next episode cut together, and then we're getting dailies from the thing. It's just constant, like it doesn't stop. Um, so you're really hoping you have writers that when you read it, it feels like it's all came from one voice and it's all one mm -hmm. thing. And the, we we fired three writers this year, and it's because you 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 realize some people just can't do it. They just they worked on you know a procedural show, and so all the cops talk tough and all the firemen talk tough, and it's like no, you got to find the voice that we created, and then you got to match that voice, you know. And so everybody sees the same show each week. What a question. Uh, back there. What's the balance between real life experiences <coughs> that play into the story as opposed to, you know, uh, imagination and fiction? You know, for example, the scaffolding that fell at the Hancock Tower. Yeah. Uh, um, God, 75% of what we do is a story we've heard a fireman tell or, um, or, uh, or that we experienced while we were doing the ride-alongs, um, which I filled, I filled a full notebook, a full, you know, um, you call those things Moleskine uh, notebook with just listening to the stories. And, and it's hilarious because everything that we talked about on day one in the writer's room ended up being in episodes. But then then you got to put your own stamp on it. You got to put it in these characters' voices and these characters' heads. I'll give you a great example is the episode we're shooting now, which I don't want to spoil anything. But, but there's two ways that firefighters can handle a situation. Oh, I talked about an episode before. There, there's based on a true story, um, something that Michael and I saw was uh, a drunk driver hit another car, and it was in a it was a crowded area, and a kid was laid out on the street, and this crowd around the kid was about to fucking turn on this guy, this drunk driver, and so we said to the the um, paramedic, how how do you handle a crowd control in this kind of situation? And he's like, I pick out the biggest off the dog in the thing and I hand him an IV bag and say, will you help me? And then that guy starts saying, back up, back up, back up. And so so we had two characters, Severide and Casey, if you watch the show, and the way they handled that situation are totally different. Severide says, back up or I'm gonna knock you on your ass. And Casey says, hold this IV bag. And, and you know, so it's like, you know, one guy's muscle and one guy's thinking. And, <coughs> So it's, that's the whole thing is you got to, so it wasn't the real incident, but we, we put our own stamp on it. What percentage of each episode's budget is spent on like jaws of life and <laughs> you know, cars that have been wrecked? And we got a friend, uh, a big writer in LA, and he's like, uh, here come the saws! <laughs> like everyone's saying they get the saws out. Uh, the budget, um, uh, we have we have a pretty healthy budget for each episode, which is nice. So um, we we've, we've been told a couple of times, can you scale it back? Do you mind saying what the range is? I mean, they, I'm worried like we're between three and four million per episode, which is which is pretty healthy. Um, the uh, which is funny because the independent movie we made, the whole budget of the movie was seven million dollars, and then we spent it in a week on this. <laughs> but, uh, Did you happen to hear about? Uh, I don't know if you were in town when uh, you were shooting an episode where a plane had gone down. Yeah. And uh, the WGN Morning News. Did I hear about it? <laughs> 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 the guy in the helicopter 
Oh, well, so here's the rest of that story. So yeah, the newsman on the thing said, as they were like freaking out that nobody was told, he said, oh, that's a show no one watches. So we saw that. And then we got Herman and Mouse to shoot. We put the camera up high, and we did a pickup. And Herman says, uh, oh, uh, the news is here. And Mouse was like, that's WGN. Nobody watches. Yeah. <laughs> but NBC did not let us do that. We, we had it. Uh, two more questions. What is this, Sirens? He's asking about the show is called Sirens? The Sirens, which is a comedy. Wait, uh, but that's about like the mythical sirens that try to no. lure <laughs> the boat. Dennis Geary of Rescue. What? Has, uh, has, is producing a pilot okay. that is yet to for USA that is a comedy. About? Paramedic. <laughs> I had no idea until you just said it. Am I worried? Yes. No, I'm worried. They're, they're going to be in town this month uh, shooting additional uh, elements of the pilot they shot here in the fall. So I will do all I can to sabotage. <laughs> Good luck, everyone who's working on that. I'm just getting more than earlier. Great for Chicago. Well, actually, I remember uh, when the season began, I was speaking to people from Big Wolf. Yeah. The Chicago Fire Post from the Mob Doctor, which did not survive, which ended in um, December. And I was saying, I feel like there should have been some sort of like softball league or something yeah. between the two shows. Yeah, they should have just <laughs> that they weren't around. <laughs> Here's the funny thing, I will say. Like, with movies, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have a lot of friends that are writers. And with movies, you're, you're pulling for everyone's movie um, to do well. You don't, unless it's coming out the same weekend as you, but even then, you're like, more the merrier, all Lobes or eyes, whatever it is. But with TV, what I've learned is like, there's a real like, I don't want anybody else to be successful. <laughs> like, I don't want to be the one on NBC that is doing well. But that's, dog, dog. Uh, that's Schadenfreude that I should <laughs> run away from. So. Right. Okay, one I'm more. Okay, um, in regards to the making of the Yes. It could be suggested to the casting director that perhaps Paul Giamatti would make an exceptional. <laughs> Are you reading that? Person? Well, I had to write it down before I forgot. <laughs> okay. um, just that Paul Giamatti might make an exceptional um, investigator. And secondly... Are you his agent? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking, um, what, do, what kind of actor do you have in mind for that role? Yeah, um, when we... You said it was she was asking them um, who, who could be in Billionaire's Vinegar. And um, we had, as the package, we had Gore Verbinski directing, because we we know him really well, but then he didn't want to do it. But he had Johnny Depp and Brad Pitt. So it's mm -hmm. it's like that level is going to have to do it to get it made. Now we don't have any of those anymore, so maybe Paul Giamatti. I was thinking it was like a Moneyball level type of a adaptation, right? It's like that it? budget, yeah. like a $50 million. Movie, which at that budget, that's the thing. Like Sony, like they literally have to have some great. This year probably helped because Silver Linings Playbook and Argo and some of those mid-level budget dramas did really well at the box office too. So right. let's give it a chance. This this guy's been trying to ask. Let's do it. Oh, oh, one more. I just want to say thank you for placing it in Chicago. Oh great. And seeing a lot of faces from Chicago. He's doing a lot of casting. Great. This is shameless self-promotion. I was Callahan when Dawson being called up before the discipline. Oh, I remember. Yeah, you did great. Great idea. You did great. <laughs> I think there are a number of people who have come tonight who had, you know, roles in episodes. So that's great. I know you guys really have to. It is my. I mean, and, and 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 no, it's been it's been awesome. Plus, we've used a lot of real firemen. That's been really fun for us. Casting as extras, they're the engine guys, and we give them lines in the show. So it's it's great for us. The fire department crew do that so well, and um, uh, it's funny because there, it, I do not blame you guys at all. It's it, that is a big acting thing that we, we often get, which is 
I played, you know, um, we had a two class appearances, like I was the guy who punched Paul Walker. But I think if I came back at the end, I could redeem my character. <laughs> so I get it, I get it, it's a tough job. Well, especially for Chicago actors who figure in the theater, I mean, this is a paying gig when you get a yeah. TV, which goes a long way. Dude, so. the level of talent here has been fantastic. It. NBC is thrilled with the local casting. I mean, we've really done most of the casting here on the guest roles, and it's been, we've been overwhelmed. And, I mean, uh, uh, really inspired by the performances, so yay to Chicago. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. That was pretty good clapping, but let's do real clapping for Jared.